Okay, good evening everyone and welcome. My name is Kristen Hilton and I'm Victoria's Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commissioner and I want to thank you all for coming to join us for the 2019 Human Rights Oration with our fantastic guest speaker Virginia Trioli. There are close to 400 of you here tonight and this event is also being live streamed on our Facebook page and following Virginia's address, we're going to have an opportunity for you to ask questions, kind of Q&A style. And you can submit your questions via the Slido website. You just go to the address on your screen and use the event code Oration2019. Hopefully, there we go, the details are up there. And you can also vote for other people's questions. And if you'd like to join the conversation on social media, you can use the hashtag HRWVIC 2019 and tag the Commission on Twitter or Facebook. So that's the housekeeping done and I really want to welcome you all and acknowledge that today is International Human Rights Day. It's a day when we celebrate the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 71 years ago, which saw a coming together of people all across the world in the aftermath of the Holocaust to say never again. We must better protect the rights of all people to be free from torture, from violence and discrimination. We must enshrine in laws the right to equality, dignity, respect and freedom. We must understand that to value one another is our greatest safety. To engage in fear and contempt, that's our gravest error. And in 2019, the hope and the laws that underpin these aspirations remain as important as ever. One of the rights to our great detriment that has never been realised in this country is the right of Indigenous people to self-determination, to identity as a people, language and culture and territorial lands, for a rightful place and a say in the laws of this state and nation. This holds us back. It denies our past and it confounds our future and it undermines our commitment to equality and this must change. Today, 30 Indigenous people from across Victoria, elected to the First People's Assembly, met in our State Parliament for the first time to discuss the treaty between the Victorian Government and Aboriginal nations. And I want to acknowledge the courage and conviction of those Assembly members, their families and their communities for bringing us to this point. And I also want to acknowledge the rightful owners of the beautiful land that we meet on tonight. This country is the only one in the world where you can experience the oldest living culture of humankind. This is the traditional land of the Kulin Nation. Please join me in welcoming David Tunia, representing Auntie Carolyn Briggs of the Bunawarung Foundation to deliver this evening's Welcome to Country. Thank you, David. Woman Jika, I'd like to pay my respects to my ancestors, but not only my ancestors of the Bunurong, which for those who don't know, goes from the Werribee River all the, way into, all the way to Wilson's Prom, covers both the bays, and the Kulin Nations, which is made up of five different mobs. Obviously the Bunurong, the Jar Jar Rung, the Tanurong, the Wadarung, and of course the Wurundjeri, which makes up the Kulin Nations which covers central Victoria. As a descendant of Bunurong, Melbourne's first people, I'm pleased to be able to welcome you here today on behalf of Papanada Caroline Briggs. For those who don't know, Papanada means old auntie. We are especially pleased to recognise the commitment that the Victorian Equal Opportunities and Human Rights Commission has made here today in paying respects to the spirit of this land and its first people. Through this, you have shown willingness to honour sacred ground. It is important for all Victorians to understand and appreciate the history and culture of the Indigenous people of Melbourne who have played a significant role in the development of Melbourne 
both before and after European arrival, as it is unknown to many who live on this country. The struggles preserve our culture began with our ancestors in the 1830s. One of the lessons we should take from these struggles was the way our elders and leaders forged alliances that led to many achievements that we take for granted today. As Australians, whilst we all have descended from different clans and different language groups and countries across the world, we can all take from these lessons. The word welcome in Bunurong is woman jika, and it translates to come with purpose. It is a contract between the Bunurong as the custodians of this country and yourselves to ensure our laws are adhered to and to guarantee safe passage for those who ask. According to traditions, this land has always been protected by our creator Bunjil, who travels as a wedge-tailed eagle, and by Wa, who protects the waterways and travels as a crow. Bunjil taught the Bunurong to always welcome guests, but requires the Bunurong to ask all visitors to make two promises which I'll ask for you today. To obey the laws of Bunjil and to not harm the children or the land of Bunjil. This commitment was made through exchange with a small bow dipped in water and the spoken words, Woman Jika. So, Woman Jika, this is Bunurong country. Welcome. Thank you, David. I'd also like to welcome special guests here this evening, Mental Health Complaints Commissioner, Dr. Lynn Colson barr CEO of the Aust Australasian Fire and Emergency Service Council, Stuart Ellis, Dr. Gemma Purdy, Deputy Secretary of Justice, Anna Faithful, Chair of the Commission's Board, Moana Weir and her son, Jordi, other board members, Rebecca Dabbs, Jennifer Hubbard, uh, the Victorian Information Commissioner, Sven Blumel, and friends, advocates, staff, past and present, Liberty Sanger and her baby Matilda, and, and family members who are here tonight as well. Human rights matter. They matter if you're a person with a disability trying to navigate the NDIS for essential support. They matter if you're a kid at school who's bullied because you're gay. They matter if you're an older person in aged care. They matter to the current population of women who are retiring with half the super of their male counterparts and are fast becoming the largest cohort of people who are at risk of homelessness. They matter to the Muslim teenager who is spat on while playing basketball and called a terrorist. They matter if you're a person with a mental illness who has to wait for months to get critical support. Because as much as we talk about, and we do see some places where there is more diversity and greater equality, each year at the Commission, we still receive thousands of complaints and reports from people of all backgrounds who don't see this diversity or feel this equality, who feel isolated and disconnected. And part of our job is to tell these stories, to understand their impact as a way of creating change. I recently watched a new TV series on SBS called Years and Years. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it stars Emma Watson as this outrageous populist prime minister of a dystopian Britain. It's clearly fictional. Um, and the show is about runaway technology, European nationalism, the failure of liberal democracy, but its overarching idea is there is a lot of crazy stuff going on. And we get told this a lot, that now is a time of phenomenal disruption. What I find it tricky to get a handle on is exactly how much is changing and how much is the appearance of change amplified through the media. Because when I think of some of the themes that our guest speaker will talk about tonight, the right to be free from sexual harassment, the rights of people with a disability, I see that in some areas the pace of change is not radically fast, it's radically slow. For a moment back in October 2017, it did feel like we were on the brink of global change. It was when the edifices propping up a few high-profile sexual predators started to shake and crumble, and women started sharing the secrets that they'd kept. Since then, sexual harassment has assumed a new prominence in public conversation. The complaints that we received, the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, have always been high in relation to sex discrimination and sexual harassment, but we're seeing an increase. 
and more and more we're working in partnership with large organisations to disrupt the structures and the foundations that have normalised sexual harassment to such an extent that it becomes part of the organisational DNA, part of the character of the organisation. And while this is happening, there's also a chorus of resistance. Hasn't it all gone too far? And I don't know about that. I do know that in workplaces across Australia today, literally hundreds of women and men suffered harassment and discrimination of some kind, which is not just unpleasant, but will make them consider whether they have to give up their jobs. And I do know that there are generations of women who have been harassed out of the workplace, denied a promotion, shamed into silence. And I think about that loss. I think about what could have been achieved. Back in 1996, Virginia Trioli had already established herself as a super clever, thoughtful and razor sharp journalist and broadcaster. Intrigued by the way in which a complaint from two female students of sexual assault against the Master of Ormond College had polarised the community, she wrote a book, Generation F, a compelling analysis of the way Australia grapples with issues of gender and power. Now, a quarter of a century later, after Generation F was first published, there is a new edition, which interrogates what's changed in a quarter of a century and what hasn't. And you could read this book and feel despairing about how familiar some of it sounds, or you could take from it, like I did, a new sense of urgency and hope that we have this opportunity now with the stories and the evidence swirling around the Me Too movement, but also stories from royal commissions into disability, aged care, mental health, about structural change, about stronger accountability and greater empathy, about a proper translation of respect and safety into our laws and our systems, the way in which we interact with each other, into, as Virginia describes it in her book, into our character. I have heard her referred to as the voice of Melbourne, but her voice is very much her own. It is poetic, provocative, witty and real, and always as clear as a bell. Virginia Trioli, welcome. Kirsten, thank you. Good evening, everyone. There's uh, really very little, I have to say, I like more than um, ending a huge year of work, including the terror and challenge of taking over from a revered and iconic mornings presenter on ABC Radio Melbourne, than by delivering a big speech on human rights to a room full of Melbourne's most important human rights advocates and some of my most severe critics. Fun times. Only Kristen Hilton, the head of the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, could get me to take on this terrifying task. And I thank you, Kristen, for this great punish pleasure. <laughs> Sorry. Because you see, I am now starting to get back just a little of my life in my beloved city of Melbourne. Presenting mornings means that now that my alarm no longer goes off at half past two in the morning. I usually get a much better reaction than that from that line. Shall we try that again? <laughs> My alarm no longer goes off at half past two in the morning. Oh, thank you. Around about the time that Kristen's coming back from the dance club, I would imagine. And um, I've figured that after 11 years of news breakfast, that if you stay up after six o'clock at night, there's a whole world out there. There's dinner and movies and theater and dancing and human rights speeches. Notwithstanding any of that, I sincerely thank Kristen Hilton and her team to briefly occupy this honourable role here, delivering the 2019 Victorian Human Rights Commission oration. Because we meet here in deeply troubled times. You know that. And it's at this point that I could, without hesitation, segue into a long and exasperated lament about the nature of contemporary politics, public accountability, the gaping more of partisan politics and partisan policy and the media coverage thereof. I could, but it seems to me that it gets you nowhere now when you do. It seems that one of the few paths through the bitter and often vicious nature of these partisan times 
is one that's actually been hacked out of the thicket by the kind of philosophy on which the Human Rights Commission itself is founded, that rights require an acceptance of responsibilities, that many don't get to have a right without somebody else taking some responsibility and choosing to understand difference and a different experience from another's perspective. I have, as Kristen said, recently revisited an issue I wrote about 23 years ago, yes, a quarter of a century. Thank you for that, Kristen. <laughs> that of sexual harassment and abuse of power for a republication of my book, Generation F, copies available for sale after the show. <laughs> and it became clear that in the aftermath of a generation of women finding their voice and deciding to no longer keep the secrets of men, that their right to work free of unwanted, intrusive and exhausting attention could really only be achieved when workplaces took responsibility for the cultures they created. And when those who harassed us stood up and took responsibility for what they had done. Let me explain a little bit about that with a story that's made it into the new edition of Generation F. If you have the book, you may have read it, so consider this a reading. It was a table for two, tucked down the back of a discreet and exclusive restaurant, perched on a tall hotel building floating high above the shimmering sapphire of Sydney. Walking in to meet an imposing Australian politician for lunch, I faltered for a moment. Why were we meeting here? Even getting to the entrance of this hushed and gleaming place had felt like a succession of doors closing behind me and the rest of the world. It was like going into the lair of a Bond villain. He was already seated and didn't get up. Wine was poured, chewy political gossip was served. This man was pompous and vain, as only one whose power is waning can be. He was far too eager to show that he knew more than I might think. The conversation moved to President Clinton and a female acquaintance who had just met him in Washington. He leaned forward across the table, a half smile. She said that she never really understood his whole charisma thing until she met him. But when she did, she said she just wanted to fall to her knees and open her mouth. You know what I mean? Why were we here? In my profession, you simply can't ever be lost for words. You have to come up with something. In my memory, I simply made stammering noises, but surely I was a little more put together than that. This wasn't my first trip to maybe she'll go down on me land, and we were sitting here in dazzling daylight with waiters all around. So why did I feel so scared? Me, a journalist with a name and reputation, why did I want to grab my bag and flee? The conversation rolled awkwardly backwards and forwards between us for a while as he continued to drop in oblique sexual references, and I kept dragging things back to the politically mundane. Then the strangest, but also the most banal thing happened. I just decided I'd had enough. I was going to burn this contact, forget about any useful intelligence he might provide me into the future, and I was going to go home. This whole little scene was bullshit. It was miserably uncomfortable for me, while clearly hugely enjoyable for him. Screw that. I thanked him for seeing me, pushed my chair back and said I had to go. No explanation why. Now it was his turn for his mouth to swing open. I've never let political contacts pay for me. I always cover my own bill. Not today. This overpriced little show was going to be on him. <laughs> I left, and I've never spoken to him again. In the aftermath of the first waves of Me Too in 2017, as Kristen has just said, the cry went up very early that men's lives were being ruined, that accusations were being flung like confetti and even the most minor transgressions were being revealed to devastating effect. It's been an effective counter strategy used by those hoping to discredit an international movement that was daily gaining ground. Except it isn't what either a woman's lifetime of experiences or the available evidence shows. The enduring truth is that we keep men's secrets. According to the Australian Human Rights Commission, in the last five years, 39% of women, and surprisingly, 26% of men, experienced workplace sexual harassment. 
The clear majority of workplace sexual harassment was perpetrated by men. 79% of victims were sexually harassed by one or more males. The research shows that while there's a small fraction of harassment by women against men, usually always by a woman in a power relationship over that man, the harassment of men was by other men, often as a tool to enforce traditional gender roles in the workplace. For example, attempting to coerce victims into the male roles and behaviour preferred by the perpetrators. The sexual orientation of the victims didn't seem to matter. The numbers are huge, but of all those harassed in the last five years, only one in five made an official report. In universities, the figure is even more alarming. 94% of those harassed on campus, and even more shockingly, 84% of those who were assaulted did not make a formal complaint. We keep the secrets without even being aware of making the decision to do so. This is the bookend to the truth that we forget more harassment than we remember. By the time the heavy door closed softly behind me on that Sydney lunch, I had in thinking, unthinkingly decided to keep this man's secret. I told no one, and I've never mentioned it again until writing it in this book here. It's one of so many. I got a million of them, as the comedian once said. It's just that they're not very funny. I was a very different person to the younger woman once bear hugged to embarrassment in the age office all those years ago, and I'm a different one again today. I'm pretty sure these days I'd tell my lunch companion that I knew exactly what he was doing, and I'd give him precisely one chance to knock it off. Or would I? A few months after I gave a widely reported speech last year about a life of working in the media, I was invited with my husband to a friend's house for dinner. In that speech, I'd told a number of Me Too stories about various men I'd worked with, including one about the senior editor who said to my manager, and I must uh, apologise for the language here, who said to my manager when he was passionately arguing for a pay rise for me, are you fucking her or something? I didn't get the pay rise, by the way, but we arrived at that dinner to be told that Mr. Are You Effing Her or something would be joining us. Now, I'd sometimes wondered if any of the blokes recognised themselves in the stories I told in that speech. One certainly didn't. He described my speech as a powerful contribution to the literature of Me Too. <laughs> I remember thinking at the time, well, you'd know, mate. <laughs> Was this man going to recognise the memory as one that included him? If I've forgotten more harassment than I remember, maybe he has too. We walked in. I took one look at his face and it was miserably clear. He'd read the speech all right. And he remembered too. He looked like he was going to be sick. We greeted each other warmly and in that moment, in that extraordinary choice, that I made to step forward, take his hand, and receive the offered peck on the cheek, I took on a time-honoured and self-annihilating role. I was going to keep his secret. We were about to have a lovely night. The food and wine would be superb. We were all dressed up. We deserved a nice evening. As it turned out, like generations before me, I wasn't going to rock the boat. But here's the fascinating thing. I wasn't even aware of making that choice. The part of me trained in being a survivor, in making nice and just laughing it off, that part just kicked in and took over without me even realising it. We had a lovely night. We keep men's secrets and the aching burden that comes with them and probably always will. And this is the reality check that needs to be made against the impression that 2017 sparked a free-for-all of destructive and baseless accusations from women everywhere. The truth that has endured from before the time of the Ormond College matter is that people rarely move quickly and without hesitation to make complaints. And if ultimately they do decide to complain, then it's not without grave reflection and often after being seriously advised against it. The figures show that women and men keep their counsel, they keep the secrets, and they have good reason to. There's a mutual correspondence between the concepts of rights and responsibilities 
that I started my talk with here this evening. There is a transferal of care and even compassion that must take place for even an implicit right to become a lived reality. It's a relationship. It requires a rethink of the responsibilities that we all carry. And it requires people to acknowledge each other and to work together. And not just in harassment, and not just in sexual discrimination law, but in every aspect of life that excludes or marginalises other Australians. So many Australians. Your fellow Australians. Let me share with you another example of this. I recently came across an alarming commentary on the gaping hole in the Disability Discrimination Act over the concept of reasonable adjustments. That's what they're called, that disabled employees should be able to expect in their workplace in order to do their jobs. The special equipment, the modifications, the additions that might be reasonably expected of an employer for that employee to safely and happily work there. In a scenario straight out of a Joseph Heller novel, and you know which one I mean, a recent legal case in the federal court has found that not only must a person with a disability show that they're disadvantaged by a failure to provide a reasonable adjustment, but that the failure to provide the adjustment was caused by the person's disability. It's an elegant, vicious conundrum a veritable double helix representation of Joseph Heller's Catch-22. Joseph Heller also wrote one of my favourite admonitions. The enemy is anyone who's going to get you killed, no matter which side they're on. It's easy and a little cheap, I suppose, to light upon the absurdities of bureaucracy and occasionally the law in order to break inconsistencies or contradictions that will probably be eternal. But the disabled person in this scenario only gets their rights at work recognised when said workplace takes on as their responsibility the reasonable adjustments that the law requires. And when an incredibly important and longed for scheme finally comes into effect, the NDIS that Kristen mentioned before, one designed to ensure support into the future for such Australians with disabilities, and it ends up being for so many people, the equivalent of a no-win round of friendly fire, it gets a little hard to distinguish friend from foe. Let me explain. Here's a little story about the NDIS. Let me first make clear that I'm thrilled, like hundreds of thousands of others, that we finally have in this country this disability insurance scheme. And I acknowledge the happy success stories of people who have received good outcomes. And let me also acknowledge that the spiral into misery that I'm about to describe is just the kind of hole out of which many at the Commission here spend their days trying to dig people out of, so apologies if this is woman splaining. But I've recently had to navigate the eligibility requirements of the NDIS on behalf of a family member. For this young person, I'm trying to be some kind of an advocate. A brief digression. Throughout my career as a journalist, I have had many great mentors. But for true inspiration, often I've relied on the innate strength, wisdom and bravery of the immortal character created by Marg Downey on TV's Fast Forward called Gina Hardface Bitch. <laughs> Do you remember her? I'm Gina Hardface Bitch, so shut up. A character so sublime, she's second only to Magda Shabansky's Chenille from Chenille's House to Boutte and Hair Removal. I know you remember her. But even with Gina on my side and my own determination, the NDIS system came close to defeating me. And that means we have a problem. So listen, I first called the NDIS to start the application process. This understandably took some time to record all of the child's details. I had to phone back a week later with some additional information, only to be told that the details would be entered incorrectly in the first instance. So we did it all again. I was told I had 28 days to gather all the medical and allied health reports needed to submit with the application, or I'd have to call back and apply for an extension of time. I said I already knew that one doctor would be away until the following month, so could I get that time extension underway now? I was told that was impossible until we were closer to the deadline. I'm gonna pause here and remind you, 28 days to get appointments with the professionals, assessments from those professionals, and then receive written reports from them all. 
We're talking about people with whom it's well nigh impossible to get an appointment within two weeks of phoning. All this in only 25 days. Was the world going to end in 28 days? All right, on with the call. Then I was asked for the child's CRN, their Centrelink customer reference number. And the world fell in. The bloke at the end of the line typed in the number. No, that's wrong. I went back to the documentation and read it out again. No, that's wrong. Try with an uppercase letter at the end. No, makes no difference. Try it again, typing. No, it's wrong. Well, that's the number I have. Can you cross-check that with Centrelink? No, we're not allowed to talk to them. But you're entering the number into Centrelink's system. Silence. So what do I do? Call them and get the right number. But it's a number printed here on a document from Centrelink. Sorry, you have to call them. I didn't phone them. Wait times on that line exceed the time that it takes to make cheese. <laughs> I drove to Centrelink, and a tired but very helpful woman behind the counter told me that, yes, it was the right number. OK, I said. So I think this issue should probably be solved agency to agency, given the NDIS is trying to tap into your system to verify this child. Could you please contact them and verify the number? No, we're not authorised to contact them. What if I authorise you to contact them? No. I go home and I call the NDIS. By the way, amazingly short wait times on the NDIS phone lines. I don't know why. And I tell the nice man on the end of the line the story and that the CRN I have is correct. He types it in again. No, that's the wrong number. At this point, a little ghost of Franz Kafka sticks its head around the corner of my room and pokes its tongue out at me. The enemy is anybody who's going to get you killed. There's a nice moment of solidarity in this story when the very sympathetic man on the end of the phone also realises that we seem to be stuck in an absurdist short story and suggests that we simply push ahead with the application, we'll deal with this CRN issue later. I'll spare you details of the weeks of appointments and cancellations and written reports and two extensions of time later. Finally, the application is lodged. A very nice and very earnest woman rings me to say the application has been received. But she has just one question. My heart starts beating very fast. What's the child's CRN? <laughs> Breath steady, so very steady, I very carefully take her through the story. Well, she says, I can check the child's nationality through the Centrelink database, and that'll give us the CRN. Would you like to authorise me to do that? I'm sorry, what now? You can go into the Centrelink system. Yes, yes, I can. Yes, I authorise it, yes. <laughs> Typing. Yep, I've got the number here. I ask her to read it out, and I write it down. After her very pleasant call, I compare her number with the number that I've been reading out to these services for the last three months. It's exactly the same. In this job of journalists that I've been privileged to hold for almost 30 years, any number of these bureaucratic nightmares have come my way. And it's in equal parts satisfying and galling to see how the roadblocks quickly vanish or the obfuscation stops the moment Fairfax or News Limited or the ABC is on the line. But I was just me in these exchanges. No fierce and forensic questioning here. Not much Gina Hardface bitch either, actually. You don't let her out in the Centrelink office, I tell you. <laughs> Just the barely contained panic of the ordinary citizen, pretty powerless to stop the whole thing from just slipping away. Now, replace me in this story with someone with very little English. Replace me in this story with the very disability we were trying to get some support for. Replace me with the person who has limited speech or hearing, or who comes from remote Australia with limited communication, or with someone who has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Replace me in the line at Centrelink with an adult autistic who struggles with self-regulation and who loses it at that tired but nice woman at the front desk. Now our autistic friend is in trouble, and her application becomes a distant second to dealing with the police 
who have just been called in to deal with her. We have created a marvellous system, a much needed system, and while the variations in the scheme between those who get support and packages and those who get little and those who get none are still too many, at least we have a bipartisan undertaking to fund the NDIS into the future. But the best of intentions evaporate like New Year's Eve resolutions when they're let down by the machine constructed to enact them. It was instructive that every person I encountered in this process was hardworking, helpful, cheery, and kind. I had to confront their system every few weeks with one of my dread calls. They had to deal with it daily, and their optimism and their energy put me to shame. In a way, I had to make the reasonable adjustments here. As someone in the powerful position of understanding the bureaucracy, and having the language and the skills to navigate it, possessing an armory of interrogation skills, and hell, probably even somewhere having a phone number to some boffin, a pin that I could pull in extremists that I could call if I really needed to. I was no rube here. It required me, the able, privileged and powerful, to adjust my thinking, my approach, and frankly, to self-regulate. It's both an aside and I think increasingly central to our social reality that those who are most able to make the reasonable adjustments in our society, me, you, are the ones least required to do so. And that seems to me bitterly unfair. Rights and responsibilities. I'm tonight in a room full of warriors for the cause of reasonable adjustments, access, equity, representation, justice those making constant readjustments of society towards fairness and towards inclusion, and I am overwhelmed by the work that you do. Your work is made that much harder by what I'm confronted with on a daily basis in my work, with the intransigence and the ideological partisanship bordering on bloody-mindedness of policymakers, by the oft-times vicious and unyielding rhetoric of those who have made it their life's work to foment fear, resentment, and disbelief about important institutions represented here tonight, such as the government, the courts, public servants, teachers, the Human Rights Commission. These blowhards are now seeing that payoff in a retreat from trust that is genuinely frightening in how quickly it has divided this country. It's going to take many people, many groups, a hell of a lot of work to restore trust that's fundamental to a functioning democracy, including a transparent, accountable, and disinterested press. And we have a fair bit of house cleaning of our own to do there. But as Tommy Lee Jones says in Men in Black, a movie that's not quoted often enough in my view, <laughs> while people may be panicky, dangerous animals, a person is smart. Speak to even the most alarmed and panicked Australian as an individual, as I get to do on ABC Radio, or as I got to do for 11 years on News Breakfast, or in the brilliant forum that is Q&A, and their humanity and their desire to be included and to connect becomes very quickly clear. It's a shared humanity that even the most disenfranchised instinctively want to embrace. Fear and mistrust is simply the cloud that's rushed in to fill the anxious void. The enduring work that those working in human rights and anti-discrimination law do connects on a very real, very intimate level with the lived experience of Australians, and it is genuinely life-changing stuff. It defends and preserves rights at a time when there are those who really seem to take pleasure in their destruction. The enemy is anybody who's going to get you killed. I refuse to believe that we can't come back together as a community, despite the feverish attempts to divide us. And I know that when people can clearly understand the experience of another, as my broad radio community shows every day, understanding can be as deep as it is swift. The dance of rights and responsibilities merged as one in a flash of compassion. It's the most important work of all, the struggle to adjust a complicated world, to acknowledge and to include all of us. More strength to your arm. Go well. Thank you.
absolutely. Thank you so much, Virginia. There is um, so much in that oration that I think resonates with everyone here tonight. We now have about 15 minutes for questions, and we've got a number of them that have come through on Slido, so I'll attempt to get through a few, um, and I'm going to join Virginia over here. Are we great? I think so, yes. So this is a bit of a reverse role for you. I hate that. <laughs> Usually you would be the one asking the questions. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to start, and I wanted to ask you about um, what has been the difference from being on TV where you don't get the sort of audience participation or the talkback participation that you do on morning radio, and how have you adjusted to that? Well, that connection and that intimacy has just been fantastic. So it, it is rather like being in a very large room a very, very big room into which people are coming and going the entire time. Uh, and that's just been an absolute joy. The best stories come from you. The best stories come from the listening community, not from the dreary politicians to whom I have to speak from time to time. Um, so I would, I would urge you to share whatever you think matters to your community with me, and we'll do our absolute best to, to cover it on the program. But that's been a really great change. Um, a challenge has been that um, for 11 years now, I've been in a very visually performing environment and I found myself sort of you know mugging for the camera and there was no camera in the room and I realized that I had to do it all with my voice so that's been a, a big challenge and um, no one does my hair anymore of a morning <laughs> it's the saddest thing of all I used to leave work at 10 a.m. with perfect hair Not anymore so Virginia the story that you told about the NDIS um, I heard there was lots of laughter in the room, but it was sort of a tragic comedy, really. It was. Um, and, and one of the questions that has come through was, how do we keep the hope that we need um, and the need to believe in what the NDIS stands for and the investment in that when so many members or so many people who are eligible for the NDIS are experiencing the type of Kafkaesque system yeah. that, that you talked about? I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know that I have the solution to that because people far more qualified than me have... They've not been defeated by it, but they're struggling with it. Um, clearly, there's, there's a, a bureaucratic aspect to it in the establishment of it and I think in the training of many of the people who go out and make the assessments that is a real problem. Uh, what I hear on, on, uh, for, on News Breakfast and particularly on radio, my predecessor John Fain did a lot of work on this as well, is the unevenness of the outcomes. And they're ridiculously uneven, even in situations where you almost have identical scenarios, identical families and, and, and situations. It's, it's crazy, which means there's too much subjectivity in the process. Um, and while I would not want to remove any of that you know, individual assessment and need for empathy from the person assessing, there surely has to be a way of um, uh, modifying the training and getting the, 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 the training at a certain acceptable level. Um, I think that the system actually shows that it's been so chronically under-recognised in our community for so long that the moment the system was established, everyone just rushed in and said, finally, thank you, me. I, I can get something for my, for my husband, for my daughter, for my partner. And it's just overwhelmed the system. They possibly should have seen that coming. Um, but th I think that's been a, a really big problem. So one of the common themes between your discussion of sexual harassment and accessing the NDIS was when people do try and seek the assistance or they do try and make a report or a complaint, just how difficult some of the processes to navigate can be. And certainly at the Commission, we hear about the re-traumatisation that people go through when they actually develop the courage or find the courage to make an official complaint. What, you must hear a lot of that as well. You know, you quoted figures that only one in five people make a formal complaint. We've worked with organisations where it's as low as 3% or 11% of people making a, a complaint around discrimination or harassment that they've experienced. Uh, the, the figures that I got from the um, Human Rights Commission on that were you know, really shocking, but more revealing were the case studies and the experiences. The uh, Australian Human Rights Commission is, is just about to complete their big na national review, if you like, survey of sexual harassment in the workplace. And uh, people sent in their stories and they had more than 500, I think it was, case studies on their website. And I read through as many of those as I could. 
and the details of them are dismayingly similar to them all. Uh, and it comes down to the fact that it's not a good idea to report inside your organisation. What's happened, I think, is that the, the, the promise of the laws that were put in place all those years ago when I wrote my book in, to allow you to make a complaint uh, should you feel that you've been harassed, the response inside workplaces with the policies that they've come up with are nuclear, really. If you push that button, it goes sky high. And you were referencing before the idea of workplace character, which I speak about in the book. And we're going to have to move to a much more human way and a much more brave way of dealing with these transgressions when they happen, not leaving them to fester. Uh, the, the person who's been accused being brave, the workplace itself being brave, management being brave for God's sake, and HR in particular, uh, and allowing a bit of humanity to be understood and admitted into that situation because the policies are just sort of like a, um, a, you know, a vice-like grip. And once you, it seems in many cases, you're talking to those stories and, and those who work in the field, once you're in that group, it's, it's terrible for everyone, for the person who has been accused as well as for the person making the accusation. And I, I know you know more about this than me. Well, it, that is certainly something that we observe and for, for some time now we've talked about the fact that the system places far too much onus and burden on the individual to make that complaint. Yeah. And while R you're Rather than it being picked up by the workplace. That's right. Yeah. And, and you're absolutely right. While we do have laws and protections around sexual, op uh, sexual harassment and equal opportunity and we have a positive duty under our Equal Opportunity Act, what we don't have is enforceability. Uh, enforceability that you have in other regimes, other occupational health and safety regimes or environmental protection regimes. And it's not until we have that enforceability that I think that people will sit up and take notice about the responsibilities and the accountability that you referred to. No, that's right, because at the end of many of those policies, as Kate Jenkins, the um, Sex Discrimination Commissioner, has found, is basically a pot of money, um, because the easiest option is to pay someone out. Here's a great whack of money, here's a cheque, just go. Um, unfortunately, often it means the person who's been accused, they end up leaving too, because the situation can be just as scarifying for them. I've had, there's a few questions here, um, which I'm not gonna go into about the documentary that's been playing on the ABC over the last couple of weeks, but I did want to ask you more generally about your response to the reporting of sexual harassment in the media. Well, it's been a very different thing here in Australia and um, leaving the, the very unfortunate Tracy Spicer snafu to one side, which I will just say one, briefly, one brief thing on. I don't want you to think that I'm ducking out from underneath that because it's been really unfortunate. I, I think you, you need to be um, trained in a certain kind of journalism in order to take on a task like that and to do it um, you know, as well as you possibly can. It would be incredibly hard really for anyone. I mean, you need a big team of people uh, you need the support of a big machine, and I, by that I mean a media organisation behind you in order to do it. You need lawyers uh, and you need advisors, and I, I think Tracy Spicer was incredibly well-intentioned, and I know she came at this from the right place, but she was very literally overwhelmed, um, and it was you know, extremely unfortunate. And um, I, I could think of a, a better construction of you know, a journalist surrounded by other journalists who could have um, managed all that. Um, was your question about what's changed? No, it was more about what the reporting. Ah, the, the reporting of it. Yeah. Is around yes, but in Australia, it's been really different because of our defamation laws. Um, you, you had you had the cry of you know, Kaz Cook's wonderful phrase. Remember, gone too far. It's about G O R N, gone too far. Uh, you had the cry, the cry of gone too far here. You know, at, at, the, at the first peep that women were actually starting to unlock some of those secrets over there because you're dealing with a very different um, you know, defamation law regime, women were able to come forward and speak their truth. Now, I, I'm a big supporter of what Ronan Farrow says, the New York Times journalist, who also was part of the, the very early and important reporting around Me Too, where he was asked when a woman makes a, an accusation, do you believe her? He said, no, I don't believe, I investigate, um, which I think probably you know, links in exactly with what you do at the Commission as well. You don't just automatically believe, and as a journalist, I do that too. It's not that I don't disbelieve, but you investigate thoroughly. You go into it with clear eyes and disinterestedly, and you try and, as compassionately as you can, uh, investigate what the truth of it is. But it's very hard to do that here. Um, 
And what I think was really galling to me about what I've seen as a big backlash and overreaction to the very, very little reporting around so-called Me Too um, uh, stories here is that, well, I'll give you an example. The stories that I told you here tonight, they're all um, de-identified. I mean, I've made slight little changes and modifications. I've sent them off to my lawyer, one of the best defamation lawyers in town, and he's gone over it with a fine-tooth comb and come back and said, yeah, Virginia, they're fine. Now, why have I done that? Why am I still keeping men's secrets? Because if I don't, it becomes my problem all over again. I didn't ask for the harassment. I didn't ask for any of that stuff to take place. It was bad enough in the first place. But if I stand up and name names and call people out, then all of a sudden it's mine to justify and it's mine to stand up and it's mine to prove and it's mine then to explain away uh, how I could possibly do that to a man who's now lost his career or lost his wife or lost his public standing. The harassment becomes your problem over and over and over again. And I think that's what is most frustrating about uh, the, the backlash against the, the paucity of Me Too reporting that's been here in Australia. Do you, are you hopeful about what might, cha might, might change as a result of the movement? I am still, because there is something about um, a tidal wave. There is something about a wave that builds and the energy that it brings that at a certain point is unstoppable. And I do feel that women are remembering now what they've forgotten and that for reasons that matter to them, either claiming their, uh, their lives back or feeling a sense of, of vindication or even just wanting to warn other people of the situation. And in saying women, I'm always happy to acknowledge, as I, I did up there in my speech, that men are uh, harassed too in complex ways. Uh, as that continues, and you, you can't sort of put that back in the box, you know, that can't be locked away again. And I think it takes time I don't think it's easy just, you know, this movement explodes and all of a sudden you can easily knock away the hand of someone who is in a direct position of power to you. That is never an easy thing to do when people say to us, oh, why didn't you just punch him in the nose? Seriously? Are you actually advising me to assault someone? What, then I get charged with assault? I don't think so. And it ain't that easy to punch someone in the nose. <laughs> it's not a choice I'd ever make. So I think, I, I think that's going to be harder and harder to, to, to keep down. One of the things that we see is while we talk about instances of discrimination or harassment as occurring against the individual, what we also see is the rippling impact that that has on their partners, yeah. on their husbands, on their children, on their family and friends. Um, so this reverberates out across society and across families and across relationships. It really does. The, the speech that I spoke about in, in the talk that I gave tonight was a, a speech that I gave at the Women in Media Conference in Brisbane, which is held every year. Um, and if you work anywhere near the industries of media or communications, I would urge you to go. It's a really brilliant conference. And each year, one of the best known uh, media lawyers in the country goes to that event and he, he does the same session every single year. And it's a session about what do you do if you're being harassed at work, bullied at work, discrimination against at work. And, uh, and that's where he just, you know, shakes his head and said, look, you know, sorry, HR is not your friend. My apologies to anyone who works in HR here in this room. Um, but that's his experience. But he also says, by the time anyone comes to us with their complaint, he says, they're already very, very unwell. They already developed a, a number of anxiety conditions and physical conditions as well. And as you say, that unwellness spreads around to their circle, um, to their children, to their family. They're not working effectively. And it, it sometimes really is, it seems to me, a, a real failure of our common humanity that we just, some of us, refuse to acknowledge that something that seems minor to us might really badly affect someone and affect them for all time. You know, God, it was just a shoulder massage. You know, what are you carrying on about? But when it was something that was uninvited and unwanted, when it was by someone who alarms you or frightens you, or someone who, you know, writes your paycheck, when you raised it and you're fobbed off and told that you're lying, that you're making it up or you're exaggerating, I don't think it takes much imagination to feel how that just the injustice of that just burns inside you. And, you know, the, the victim, the, the, the attacker finds the victim as, as he finds her. So if it's someone who is prone to that anxiety and who is likely to go, go down that path, it can be a, a shocking thing. 
This is the last question for the evening. Um, we're going to let everyone file out into a lovely Melbourne evening. Although I'm happy to sign books if you'd like me to. Of course, signing the books, everyone buy the book. Um, and on, on that note, actually, the question is, what is on your Christmas reading list? <laughs> you referenced a few classics there, Kafka, yeah. Joseph Heller. <laughs> There's no Kafka there. Um, <laughs> well, so it's not my Christmas reading list, it's my pile of shame, which is by my bed and which gets bigger and sort of bigger, you know, every month. Um, I'll make an admission here, and on my reading list are all the books that I sort of skim read in order to interview the authors on television and on air. Um, you know, that bit, that bit, where it fell open, the end, the beginning, couple of moments. So I'm not naming any names for fear of offending any of them, uh, but all of those books were fabulous, and now they deserve my complete attention which I will give to them. Everyone, can you thank me? Join me in thanking Virginia Trioli. It's a, is, is Matilda asleep? Matilda's asleep. Matilda's she asleep. heard it all, and she'll be a fighting feminist forevermore. Um, it's, it's such a fantastic, even though some of the stories that you told are hard and confronting, um, you can still feel that there's a lot of hope and energy in the room and from everyone uh, in, in the human rights community, from family and friends and people who have come here tonight, thank you. Thank you for supporting the work of the Commission. Uh, thank you for caring about these things. Have a beautiful festive season and uh, we will see you all here this time next year, 2020. Thank you very much. <laughs>